Hello, and welcome to Breast Cancer Conversations, a podcast brought to you by survivingbreastcancer.org. I'm Laura Carfing, breast cancer survivor and founder of survivingbreastcancer.org, a nonprofit organization providing community, education, and resources to empower those diagnosed with breast cancer and their caregivers from day one and beyond. Hello, hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of Breast Cancer Conversations. I am so excited for today's conversation because I have the pleasure of speaking with Rachel Burns. If you don't already know the name, I know you're going to be Googling her and looking her up after this conversation because it was just so fun and she is so incredibly talented. Rachel Burns is a singer. She's a songwriter. She went to school in Boston. And as you guys know, I live in Boston, so I feel like the connection was already like, you know, meant to be. And I am just so excited. She is a mother of two an incredible breast cancer advocate, and one of the founders, I want to say, or co-founders of Cancer Culture. So, so much great stuff to dig into today. I really hope you enjoy. But before we get started, I wanted to make sure that you know, again, that this podcast is being produced by survivingbreastcancer.org. We are your online virtual community from weekly newsletters to virtual events and programs, expressive writing, art therapy, support groups, you name it. We also have our NBC webinar series, and are now also offering all of our programs in Spanish. So yes, hop on over to survivingbreastcancer.org forward slash events so you can see everything that's happening and we hope to see you online soon. So let's dive right in. Welcome to the conversation. Hello, well, Rachel, I am so excited to have you on today's episode of Breast Cancer Conversations. I love being able to get to meet members in our breast cancer community who, you know, I think sometimes we're like, oh, yes, breast cancer. We're like, we're immediately bonding. We're reunited. But then we forget that, like, we wear all these other hats. We are moms. We are daughters. We are, in your case, are like an amazing musician and singer and songwriter and also uh, running your own nonprofit as well as part of cancer culture. And so I am so excited to dive into all of these topics today and get to know you, have our viewers and listeners getting to know a bit about your story. And what we were just discussing, celebrating 10 years since your initial diagnosis. So I think that is a huge milestone. I know we're always like, you know, worried about that next checkup, that next scan, getting past five years, perhaps. And then now to say that you are 10 years since your diagnosis is huge. So welcome to the conversation. Thank you for having me, Laura. It's great to be here. Fantastic. Well, would you like to introduce yourself, maybe where you're calling in from and a little bit about your background? Yeah, I am in Arlington, Virginia, just a stone's throw from Washington, D.C. I was born and raised here, and I lived in Boston for about 10 years near you um, in Jamaica Plain in Roslindale, actually. Oh, yes, just um, on the and, Yeah, and so um, I, uh, you know, I was diagnosed 10 years ago with stage 3A um, ER positive breast cancer, and I just had uh, my last biannual checkup this week. So I'm really excited. I no longer need to go twice a year. Um, and I was like, no more scans. And they're like, no more scans. And I'm like, great. Yeah. So I'm on the other side of the journey. Um, so I'm really, really happy about that. Um, at, you know, we always have kind of we always are holding our breath as survivors, but I feel like I can exhale a little bit more now. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm very, very, very grateful and lucky to be in that position. That's amazing. I have to ask, and like one of the questions we get all the time, right? Like, do you ever stop thinking about breast cancer? And I would just love to get your perspective as someone who's been 10 years since diagnosis. Like, does it get easier? How are you feeling? Like, what, what can someone look forward to? I never stopped thinking about breast cancer because it was a pivotal change and um, in my life that, um, you know, was the hardest, you know, you have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death mm -hmm. when you go through cancer. So I never stopped thinking about cancer, um, I, but I have put it behind me in a lot of different ways. So I, I, I remember about seven years, um, I was, uh, you know, I, I, I started loving being on the ocean and being in, mm. in, in the ocean and being in water. And, um, I remember being on my a kayak and I was just in the middle of the ocean and just sitting there and it was on my seventh anniversary. And I just, I, I just remember saying, I'm no longer fearful of this coming back. Mm. 
which was bizarre because I work a lot with stage four, um, you know, members of our community. And, um, but I just felt in my deep gut that I wasn't going to let that fear continue to permeate, you know, my existence, you know, I was going to move on from that fear Mm. and just say, Mm -hmm. I'm going to live without the fear of recurrence anymore. Yes. Yeah, I don't know if it was the ocean or the sky or something just telling me, you know, you're going with the flow girl and just yeah, keep going. And finding so. peace with that. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. t- and it can happen at different times for different people. I think, you know, for me, when I went back to work, that was an incredibly hard transition after being on medical leave for the diagnosis. And that's when it hit me that I went through something incredibly, tra- incredibly traumatic through breast cancer, because going through the treatment, it was just like appointment after appointment. I couldn't catch my breath. It was just tell me where to go, where to be, prick me with a needle, do all the things. Um, but it was kind of re- reemerging almost back into society, getting back to work. My body changed so much trying to find clothes that fit and that were flattering. And my hair was growing back and everyone loved like the pixie hair. And I was like, yeah, I didn't pay $200 for this. It was more like 200000 right? <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, And then when every ache and pain was like, oh, my God, it's coming back. But I remember being at work, being so frustrated that I couldn't get the printer to connect to my computer. I was like this technology, like, you know, like when it goes offline and you're just like running (laughs) late for a meeting and all you have to do is print off some slides and you're just like the printer is not working. And I remember laughing because I was so frustrated that I was like, things are starting to feel back to normal. I'm no longer like annoyed about breast cancer right now. I'm annoyed about the printer. And that just felt so good because everyone talks about like things are in perspective and things don't like, you know, and I'm like, this shouldn't really matter. But right now it does. And it feels so good. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I Yeah, that's definitely something I think that is universal with us as survivors is like all of a sudden you start worrying about the little things again. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, here I am back to worrying about little things. Yes. Um, I did. I've definitely had pivotal moments like that. Yes. (laughs) Like, oh, okay. (laughs) Just like everybody else again. And I'm so curious, too. I know a lot of times we also talk about, you know, how breast cancer impacts just not our lives. And, you know, it it is kind of like this line in the sand, at least for me, where it was like the Laura before cancer and the Laura after cancer type of phase. And to some degree, I do embrace it as part of my identity. It could be because both of us and the the type of work that we're doing, right? Like we are working in Mm -hmm. the cancer community. We're working with people who are newly diagnosed or living with metastatic disease. And so I do associate it a little bit with who I am as a person. Um, it's something I'm, I'm proud of because we've gained and acquired so much knowledge about the the experience, the personal lived experience. But then also, you know, we can go on and say, you know, your diagnosis doesn't define you. Breast cancer is just one chapter, et cetera. How do you how do you feel about all of that in terms of breast cancer and identity and um, image and all of the things, especially in your line of work? I've gone back and forth on this. So that's a great, great question. So I've gone back and forth um, in whether or not I wanted to be really active in the breast cancer community as an advocate or not throughout the years. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember I wrote a lot um, on my personal Facebook page when I was going through treatment and everyone was looking to me as like an inspirational speaker. A lot of people were on the side going, oh, you should write a book. You should be an inspirational speaker. And I remember the last day of my treatment, I just said, you know, I I think I put a Facebook post out like, you know, nine months ago I was diagnosed, but today, nine months later, I gave birth to a 135 pound woman, you know, and I was just like, that was the end of what I wanted to do at that point in Mm -hmm. terms of speaking. Cause I felt like my journey ended then. And then other people, it was other people's job to talk about their journey. And I took a little break, but What I didn't know then is that cancer just keeps rearing its ugly head in terms of, you know, scares of recurrence, Mm -hmm. um, subsequent um, surgery, subsequent um, scares. um, The side effects of the treatment were really harsh for me. Um, I had to go to surgery um, seven times, um, uh, two times based on um, side effects, one time based on failure of the reconstruction. So cancer just kept rearing its ugly head. Um, and then, you know, there's the, the re- reverberations in uh, your life as well for the people around you. You know, I think um, relationships change, uh, people fall away, 
Um, I remember there was a point where, you know, my friend group kind of dissipated for me because, you know, I was told that uh, people were, you know, sick and tired of me being sick and tired and nobody wanted to hear about cancer anymore. And that was very, 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 very painful because I felt like I was really holding back on my cancer experience. And I felt like I was really controlling myself in terms of talking about it. And um, so those kinds of experiences sort of made me feel like I couldn't talk about it for a while. And then I think I got to a point where I was like, you know, fuck it. Like, I need to talk about this. This changed my whole life, my whole perspective on life. And it also is who I am. And I have a voice and I can help other people. So it was not really about me expressing myself anymore as much Mm. as it was that I had a story to tell and it was affecting, I could see the effect on other people um, of the, you know, who were inspired by my story. So that's when I decided I needed to really continue to advocate. And I also always did this concert every year for breast cancer people. So it was about once a year that, you know, the breast cancer community looked to me to do this concert that was uplifting and it was allowing a lot of metastatic patients and and early stage patients to sing on band with, with, uh, you know, sing on stage with my band and have that performance opportunity. So, um, you know, it would, even when I was silent, it would still come back up in the concert time in in October. And, you know, and then I I realized that, you know, there was a lot I could give back to the community. So I, Mm -hmm. you know, I, I dipped my toe back in and um, started advocating again in the nonprofit realm. Amazing. And I love, thank you for that kind of journey of your role. And, you know, I think this is so helpful for anyone who's like listening or trying to like make sense of their experience and that it doesn't have to be linear. You can oscillate back and forth of what's feeling good for you, how you want to engage, who you want to tell and who you want to share it with. I remember very similarly too, depending on one's line of work, you may want to keep it very close to your vest because, you know, potentially, you know, dealing with HR, even though we're protected under ADA, you know, I was passed mm. over for a promotion at the time because I was going through treatment and they will never tell me that. But at the same time, I'm like, pretty sure that's kind of what happened. Um, And so, you know, all these like small little things, and it could be because, you know, when in, in my work, you know, I work in higher education. If you Google me, it's not like my profile in higher ed shows up, right? It's my profile of, you know, being sick, being diagnosed with cancer, being a role model and hopefully an inspiration for other people. But that was a big choice that I had to make in terms of how public did I want to be with my diagnosis? And so, you know, it's not saying all in or all out, but what is that, what is that balance and what feels good for you at the time? So, yeah. And there's different points in time where that balance, you know, you have to balance. Okay. Is this, is this adding to my life or subtracting from my life? Mm -hmm. And there was a point in time where I felt like it was subtracting from my life and I need to focus on my kids and my health and myself getting back. Um, I, and to a healthy spot. And um, so I took a step back and I feel like um, there's points in time that we deal with grief as survivors um, or thrivers. And we go through the angry phase. And I definitely went through an angry phase where I had never really felt that anger before in my life. And it scared me. And I felt like it wasn't something I wanted to be around a lot of people. Mm-hmm you know, with that edge. Um, so I, I just, I kind of retracted from, from socializing for a long time, Mm -hmm. um, and really went to therapy and went through the PTSD and codependency of, um, you know, what I discovered in, in, in therapy about myself and really worked on myself. And then when I felt like I was in a healthy spot again, and not so angry at the world, (laughs) I came back out. Yes. Yes. Well, Thank you for sharing that too. I think we don't talk enough about the mental health and the toll that this diagnosis can take on us. I would love to dive into a little bit more what you what you were sharing about the timeline of your diagnosis in terms of pregnancy and you know nurturing your newborn and then being diagnosed. And I think you and I also um, share the fact that we were both vegan. You were alkaline vegan prior to your diagnosis as well, because so many people. I think when you're diagnosed, everyone talks about, you know, exercise, eat well, be healthy. A lot of people change lifestyle habits for the better, which is fantastic. But, you know, it sounds like you and I were both incredibly, 
you know, already doing that in terms of our lifestyle. So to be diagnosed with a cancer diagnosis when we felt like we were already doing everything right, quote unquote, you know, how shocking is that? And if you can also define for our listeners too, what does alkaline vegan mean? Or maybe we even just talk about what veganism is because, right? Like, what does it mean for me? <laughs> yeah. So I was raised by hippies um, and uh, I never had eaten meat in my life. Um, and so I was very healthy and I really didn't eat sugar until I got my license in high school. And then I think my senior year of high school, I was like, I am determined to have every type of candy. Like I was raised on carob. So I was like, went to the 7-Eleven every day and bought a new candy bar and was like, ah, oh, this is trash. But figured out Snickers and Reese's Pieces were my favorite. But, you know, I never had any, any, you know, sugar. Um, and so then I went to um, college in Boston and I was paying my way through college doing real estate. I got my real estate career uh, license when I was 19 and I started selling real estate and I was really good at it. And I was really good at good, <laughs> not so good, but I was really good at juggling a lot of things or so I thought. And you know, one thing I'd like to kind of touch upon is, you know, reflecting back on it, I think about myself at those times in my life, because I was a workaholic. Um, I was addicted to work um, and juggling things. And I was running on adrenaline. And I mm. feel like I was this like, floating head. When mm. I look back at myself, I didn't even realize I had a body underneath myself. I was just constantly moving, constantly moving. And in real estate, you're, you're working seven days a week. So I was going to college and working real estate seven days a week. And I, I got Crohn's colitis mm. at the age of 21. So I went, I was already vegetarian. So I went totally alkaline vegan. I read a book about alkaline veganism and oh, the added benefit, like not only does it help your Crohn's um, colitis, but it also the added benefit is it helps prevent cancer. Mm. So I was like, great, there's a lot of cancer in my family. I'll prevent cancer by this as well. So I felt really good about myself. Um, I never was into drinking. So I just stopped drinking altogether. I stopped eating all sugars, carbs. Um, uh, and I did a lot of greens and salads. I like basically lived on salads and nuts and, um, and fruits and vegetables. Um, but I just went completely into um, alkaline veganism. And I did that for about 15 years. Wow. Did you feel fantastic? Like, did your body like resonate with this type of lifestyle? It did. Well, I, at the time too, I was an opera singer. I was studying opera. So That's it so not beautiful. only oh um, changed my life, but it also like, I didn't have to, I didn't, I didn't have any gook in my throat anymore. I could just, you know, come in and practice and not have to go through that 10 minutes of, you know, mm -hmm. you do a lot of that when you're an opera singer. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yes. um, and I didn't have to do that anymore because I wasn't, you know, taking any dairy mm -hmm. and I wasn't, um, and I wasn't, you know, having all of that extra ick. So I felt really good about myself. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, I don't think, I don't think food has as much to do with, um, cancer. And this is just my own personal opinion because my dad was also alkaline vegan and he walked five miles a day and he got, um, a very rare form of cancer and he was, he passed away in eight months from diagnosis. Oh this goodness. was six years ago. So I saw it in him too, you know, that, you know, he, you can, and he was on supplements. He was like, he's a health nut, you know, he was taking, you know, a hundred different supplements yeah. and meeting all these holistic people and doing all of this holistic work and then boom, got cancer and passed away. And I don't think it's so much the food we eat. I think it's the positive interactions we have with other people, whether it's the person at the checkout counter or your friends or family, I think it's reducing stress. I think it's laughing breathing, having fun in life. Um, I think that is the thing that um, is the reduction of stress mm -hmm. that, you know, I think stress has a big factor in Huge. our, our cells kind of going haywire. Yeah. And if you want to eat that cake and that cookie or that big, huge steak, and that's what your body is telling you to do that day, do it without guilt. Exactly. Because the guilt adds a whole other layer of stress to you which you don't need, you know? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, I think that's so, so important. I know, you know, my now husband at the time, boyfriend at the time when I was diagnosed, he was also vegan with me. And 
after finding out he was like let's go get steak like what what's going on here right <laughs> I, I didn't oscillate that far but you know i think i think it was very challenging i think you're absolutely right it sounds like something with you know food and diet something that we can control something that we can make choices on and something that we can um you know make those types of decisions as you were saying like have the cookie have the cake and then also feel like going for a walk and eat the salad and finding what that good balance is for you but i feel like we just haven't discovered yet what that genetic mutation might be that created this cancer for us right like 90 percent of us who are diagnosed with breast cancer have it because of a non-genetic family familiar gene right and so then right. what what brought it on so i definitely agree about you know the stress the environmental factors the like we just haven't discovered it yet and so many of us right and the workaholic side of us the the a type all of these things forced me to stop and pause and cancel things cancel meetings cancel travel for work cancel presentations all of these things where i had to clear my calendar which is very hard for me to do but I did it. And yes. I was like, wow, I didn't realize how busy we were, right? Running around doing all these things because we could. We were living off the adrenaline and the rush and the, you know, the how the feel good feeling of getting it all done because we could do it. And then when you're forced to pause, I think is really challenging. And and I would also yeah, say too, and, you with know, like a diagnosis, I don't know if this happened to you as well, but going through chemotherapy, understanding that the dosage could change right to find that right dosage to mitigate some of the side effects maybe the treatment plan has changed i remember my doctor always coming in with new studies to say we might pair this drug now with this drug or you're her two positive let's try herceptin plus progetta not just herceptin alone and again my a type was like we had a plan why are you changing the plan and then really needing to let go and just be more adapt to the fact that medicine is not a perfect science and there is an art to it and that was also really hard. God, there were so many hard things about cancer. You're bringing out all the topics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of hard stuff. And I think that, you know, after treatment, I think when we're, when we're, are in treatment and we're an A type, it's actually easier because it's like, okay, this is what I have to do. And you're mm -hmm. just focused and you're like, I just have to get through this and then it'll, you know, and I do all the steps and it'll be fine. And then I think once you're done with treatment, and I remember reading an article when I was going through treatment from a, from a cancer patient that the hardest time was after. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that, there's no way that there's anything harder than this. And boy, was I wrong. It was so much harder after treatment for me. I mean, the reemergence, as you said, that word, the mm -hmm. reentry, mm -hmm. I call it the reentry into the world. And I, I used to tell people like during the pandemic, be careful of the reentry. Like yes. it's, it, when you re-enter into the, into the world, there's so much strange things that happen. Like, I remember when my hair started sprouting back, people were like, okay, you're back, you know? And my body's like, nope, I'm not back at all. And people would start being mean again mm. to me where before cancer, like people would be mean. And then I'd be like, why are they being mean? And then <laughs> through cancer, they were so nice. And then after I started, my hair started growing back and I started looking normal again but my body felt horrible it was like people started being mean and I was like what is going on you know mm -hmm. <laughs> you know I I didn't understand it you know and um I didn't know what to talk about and I didn't know how to have a conversation without bringing up cancer at some points yeah. especially right after treatment um and yeah it just I, then I started really getting in my head about like oh my god like who am I yes. you know <laughs> um and I think that music, writing music and isolating myself, I was always an extrovert. So I've become much more of an introvert after cancer. And I think writing music, I was always a musician, but I was always an interpreter doing jazz and opera and cover songs, you mm. know, for years and making them my own. Um, but my creativity sort of poured out of me after cancer. And I started writing my own, you know, I first started writing on social media about my experience. And then I started writing music, you know, um, 
And when I started writing songs, things just sort of poured out of me. But being in that flow state Mm. when you're writing or doing something that you really love, whether it's reading or painting or crafting or writing, when you're not thinking about anything and you're sort of in this spot where you can download and create, um, that flow state is what, what I started craving daily is, you know, having that moment of time where I wasn't caring for my children or running errands or doing things for other people. Um, And I became much more introverted and self-reflective. And that's in those moments of quiet, which I had never created those moments of quiet for myself before in my life. Those moments of quiet where I could just hear nothing but the sounds of the house buzz and my own thoughts and feelings. Those are when those moments of silence, I could just really turn off the monkey brain and download a song. Um, That was the moment that I realized that, um, you know, I could create and do something with my experience that you know, could actually save me and may, may help other people have a laugh or two too. That's so beautiful. Or feel. Yeah. I love that. I love that like flow state. I, I want to find that. I want to know what that feels like. That sounds amazing. And to have that quiet time, it's so hard, especially, I don't know if it's society or just, you know, the American culture of just go, 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 but we do not find 10, 15, 20 minutes of like decompression, breathing, silence especially as women yeah especially as women because we have to be everything for everybody mm-hmm. and uh, we barely ever are, are there for ourselves so I think finding that peace in being there for myself and being in the moment with myself was um you know a really great a great shift in my life oh, that makes me so happy Rachel like I love that that you like <laughs> found this and so tell me more about your, your songs. Like, what do you, do you talk about cancer in your songs? I know you're also, you know, weaving in a lot of your advocacy as well. Yeah. So my songs, um, I do weave in some of my cancer. So I had my first EP was, um, uh, released last year. It was called living my breast life. And so I had, um, some of my breast cancer songs on there. You know, I have an autobiographical song on there called hangy Sally's, which is really funny. So I have a lot of humor and satire in my songs. So that's, that's a humorous kind of ode to my cancer journey. Mm -hmm. And so that's a really funny one. Um, and I have a, a, a one called hope is a tricky thing. That was a hit. Um, Um, so that's more of an upbeat song and it's sort of, you know, about the toxic positivity of like hope can sometimes be tricky because sometimes, you know, what you hope for is it what really comes out, you know, and what, but, but we do need hope to get through the hard times Mm -hmm. as well. So I have a, you know, a love hate relationship with hope (laughs) sometimes (laughs) it's like, so, so important to me, but it's also like, you got to know that it's tricky. Like, yeah. you know, you have to be open to the the change uh, to the outcome, you know, not be completely married to the outcome of your hope. Um, yeah. and, um, and we see that so often as survivors and thrivers in our community. And then, um, yeah, there's a song, I did it, that was actually written by a, a, a like a well-known producer. Um, and he wrote that song for me. It's not, it's not my song. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be something I would write, but it was, you know, a great foray into the music business. So I did that song. And so there's, there's some songs that are fun like that. Um, nice. and then I have my other EP, which is what a nasty woman, which is more of my woman empowerment um, songs and there's a lot of funny songs and then there's heartbreaking songs. So on my living my breast life, I have one heartbreaking song I wrote about hospice when I, mm. you know, cause I hospiced my dad through cancer. So I'd been in the bed with cancer and then I had been beside the bed. So I wrote the song from the two perspectives. It's called not today about that hospice, um, period of like, don't leave, you know, and then mm. the spirit of like, maybe you never leave, you know, maybe you never leave somebody's side. Yeah. And then, um, you know, my, when a nasty woman, I have a, a great woman's anthem. That's pretty sad. Um, called Pollyanna's lament, which mm. is, you know, still has hope on the end, but it's written about my grandmother's experience as a woman, um, and married to somebody she, 
you know, probably shouldn't have been, but she stuck through it. So that, that song is about her experience. So, you know, it's just healing these generational traumas, um, in, in the music, but also most of my songs are humorous because I, I think laughter is really important part of healing. Oh, amazing. Thank you for sharing all of that and the vulnerability of utilizing art and music and writing and your voice uh, to to heal and then also to give that hope to other people. I use the term um, realistic positivity because it was really hard for me going through cancer when everyone was like, just stay positive, just stay positive. You get all these cards in the mail and like, oh, like you're thinking of you, just stay positive. I'm like, I am trying so hard to stay positive, but sometimes you just need to like cry or yell or scream and just it's okay sometimes not to be okay and then know the tools to like lift yourself up and so I think art is such a powerful tool to do that and you know you're you're quite talented to be able to like release these EPs be an opera singer combine you know jazz and pop and satire to your music but then also you know one of the things that we do at survivingbreastcancer.org is a lot of healing through the arts, whether that it's expressive writing or art therapy, and you don't have to be an artist to scribble it out. And I actually was not a believer in some of this stuff too, that I was like, oh, I know it's good, but like, that's not really my thing. Like I, I won't do that. I went to my first art therapy class that we were hosting and there was a warm up. I'm like, there's a warm up for art therapy. And I was like, all right, like I know about warm ups for exercise or like warm ups and like doing the scales for music, but I wasn't sure like what's a warm up in art therapy. And so we were doing just different brush strokes. We were trying, you know, the Crayolas, the Cray Pods, the paint, and we were warming up. And we got to a point where we were like, scribble as hard as you can. And I was like going crazy with my red crayon and it broke. And I was like, okay, why did I choose the color red? I just stressed and squeezed it so hard that my crayon broke. Like I am really like anxious right now. Like it was eye opening of what actually the feelings and the um, emotions that emerged that I was not expecting. So now I'm a huge believer in all of the arts and what it can bring out of you because. Oh yeah. yeah, It was so powerful. So. Yeah. No, I think um, you mentioned crying and um, you know, singing is a form of breath work. Mm. And so that's why I started doing the concert every year, not only because it was something that, you know, a survivor told me that I really wanted to do as a bucket list item, but also because, um, you know, breathing is so important. And as an opera singer, I realized, I mean, halfway through my treatment that I couldn't breathe. And then I brought out my opera and I started singing again. And that lower, lower diaphragm breathing was so important. So crying was also another thing that was really helpful for me in terms of, you know, I was always putting on a happy face, you know, through so much Mm -hmm. of my life. And I realized when I got cancer, I hadn't cried in 10 years. Wow. And I had to relearn how to cry. And I didn't want to cry in front of my kids because I didn't want them to be scared. They were only 10 months and four years old when I was diagnosed. So I didn't want them to be scared. So I would find times to go to the basement. Mm. And I realized how many different types of crying there were. There was like the ghost crying where nothing came out, but it was just like heaving. And then there was like the wailing crying and just like the hysterical crying and just all the different types of crying. And I realized it was a release that I had not allowed myself to feel the lower vibrations of sadness, fear, all of those lower vibrational things. I was on this high, 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 always positive, positive, positive Mm -hmm. my whole life. Um, Positivity, vegan alcoholism, working, 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 you know, supporting the family, da, 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 you know, and I was gigging out three times a week um, at the time I was diagnosed. So I was constantly in a movement state, but none of those things were preventing cancer. Right. Um, I was holding a bunch of stuff in that I was not allowing myself to feel, you know, I have a great rationalization brain, part of my brain where I would just rationalize behavior that was around me or, you know, feelings that I had, um, and, and just say, you know, it's okay. People are having bad days. People are going through this or that. That's why they're behaving this way. I, I have, I'm strong enough to, to keep moving. I don't need to wallow in that. I, I can just, you know, rationalize it. And I was a rationalizing empathizer for my Mm. entire life. And I never um, took a moment to say, hey, I need a boundary here with with some people 
you know, or I need to put some guardrails up to protect myself, or I need some time to work on my own stuff. You know, I never, I never, I didn't even know what that was. Mm -hmm. So right. um, I think that, that, you know, crying expression, breathing, all of that stuff is so important for us to express what's inside. As women, we hold on so much to keep the strength up for the people around us. And we're not strong enough to look at ourselves and say, hey, I need yeah. to sometimes let go. I need to express. I need some quiet. I need to scream. I They have scream rooms in cancer clinics now for a reason. You know, yeah. we need to have that, you know, that that crayon that breaks sometimes to oh. like see that mirror and go, you know what? I need to express mm -hmm. this pent up stuff that's inside of me. Oh, so true. So true. I want to switch gears a little bit and ask a little bit about your involvement with cancer culture. If you can tell us and mm -hmm. our listeners, you know, we always want to promote resources and networks and letting people know, you know, there are so many great organizations out there that, and you don't have to be loyal to just one. You can be involved in all of oh, them, no. right? And so I would love yeah. to hear your involvement with um, cancer culture. I think it was formerly called Cancer Land. So some people might notice it um, from that from back in the day with the name change. But tell me a little bit about your involvement there and the resources and support that that organization offers. Yeah, I got really involved in nonprofits um, uh, during advocacy and um but one of the people that I met very early on in her cancer journey and my cancer journey was Beth Fairchild, who used to mm. be president of Metaviver and is a very, very um, well-known uh, metastatic breast cancer advocate. So I met Beth when she um, she put something on YSC when she was first diagnosed and said, hey, I don't know anybody my age with breast cancer mm. and I just got this terminal diagnosis. And I was like, I'm actually rolling up through your neck of the woods pretty soon. You want me to come by? And we had coffee and hit it off perfectly. And we've been sort of each other's advocates for all these years later. So that was, you know, almost 10 years ago that we met. And she was the one who really wanted to sing on stage with a band. So that's how I started the concert uh, that we do yeah. every year. And then she met Champagne Joy, who was another metastatic breast cancer advocate. And um, Champagne was doing, wanted to do this New York Fashion Week. Um, uh, and she was very well connected in New York scene. So she did that and they started making documentaries together. And during one of the documentaries, she actually went into cardiac arrest right in front of Beth and all the other survivors. And Beth went and and in, into the ambulance and basically was there for her when she passed. Wow. So it was a life-changing experience for Beth. And Beth really wanted to have her legacy live on because Cancerland was her organization and Cancerland, um, you know, did the New York Fashion Week every year. And um, and she said to Beth, pretty pretty close to when she died, like within the week, like if Cancerland doesn't move on, what did I, what was my life purpose mm -hmm. anyway? So Cancerland um, was sort of at a stagnant state. And so Beth decided, you know, I really just want to focus on the documentary, telling the stories of cancer people and the fashion week. It could bring so much joy to everybody. So, um, so she came to me and said, hey, what do you think about branching off and doing Cancerland as our own organization? And I said, I'm going to support you in whatever you want. So we started working on that and um, we changed the name, name to Cancer Culture. And so in the past year, we did, we did New York Fashion Week. We did Milan Fashion Week. Wow, that was amazing. Really cool. Yeah, it was the first um, breast cancer um, ever fashion show in, you know, of that level in Europe. Um we did, uh, she did two retreats and um, documented all the patient stories. And then we put on the concert, the um, Living My Breast Life concert here in DC. And um, yeah, this year we're, we're doing a lot more. So we're just really excited to really start getting the ball rolling mm -hmm. um, in even a bigger way. You know, we've gotten some calls from other major cities for Fashion Week. Um, so um, I think we're going to start uh, doing New York Fashion Week in September because it's so close to October yes. for breast mm -hmm. cancer. Also, better weather <laughs> <laughs> and in February, which we were no, she was doing for many years. So, yeah. 
uh, having these transformative experiences for patients through walking on stage and and, in that big of an arena in New York Mm. Fashion Week or Milan Fashion Week is a life-changing experience for a lot of these advocates. Getting on stage and singing is such a vulnerable moment. Both of these experiences are you know, we we have this experience as cancer patients um, going through treatment of going through the vulnerability tunnel. Mm-hmm. And the vulnerability tunnel is like, I feel like it's a hatch, like it's a hatch door. Like if, if all of our emotions are on a scale that's linear, like, you know, vertical, we have this hatch door, like from our lower vibrations, which is vulnerability. And if we can open up that, then we can get to the higher vibrations. Sometimes we just hit our head on it and we smack back down into the lower vibrations. But if we can get through that and have those moments of vulnerability in a supportive environment with people cheering us on. Mm -hmm. So if we're walking on a stage or whether it's a fashion show or a music uh, or, or singing on stage, it's this moment of vulnerability. But if we have a room full of other advocates and other survivors gone through this or friends and family that are saying, yes, it doesn't matter if we don't have the walk of our life or the performance of our life. We're expressing ourselves. We're standing in our power and we're walking through it and conquering the fear of vulnerability. And so this is the same thing we've gone through in, in cancer. We're, we're old hats at this and having that experience that, you know, what, when we went through it, in cancer was traumatic, but having this experience that is no longer traumatic, that is, is transformative in a different positive way. Um, with these other people around us that have been in a trauma bond with us because as survivors, we have these trauma bonds, but having all of these people going, yes, do it is, it's just such a amazing thing for us. And it, it just fuels us to keep going. So that's what we want to create the space for people to have these experiences. The community, the energy, the support, like, oh, it gives me goosebumps. Like, so amazing. I'm so excited for it. Um, I'm not sure. I'm just thinking to myself, like, would I be, would I even allow myself to be that vulnerable to get up on stage uh, during a fashion week? But, um, you know, we'll (laughs) we'll see. I'll have to check out the website and see how to uh, get involved and continue to support this really great work. So Really appreciate the dialogue, the conversation, the amazing nuggets that we were able to share with our listeners. And again, take it for whatever level of hope we want to leave people with, you know, um, and an inspiration too. So Rachel, how can people find- Well, you're doing, Yeah, I just want to say you're doing great work as well, Laura, and, you know, telling the stories and allowing people to have this forum is so important. So thank you for having me. Um, and you can find me on all the social medias at Rachel Burns Music or Cancer Culture at cancerculture.org or at We Are Cancer Culture on Instagram. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story and being such an inspiration to everyone. It was such a pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you, Laura. And thank you, everyone, for listening to our show. I would like to acknowledge that all of the information on our podcast are from personal experiences and are not a substitute for professional medical advice. You should always contact your medical care team. If you're looking for specific topics or would like to be a guest on our show, please feel free to reach out to me. My email is laura at survivingbreastcancer.org. Until next time, keep on thriving.